morning, everyone, and welcome to week 10 of the semester, technically. I think it's week three or four of uh, virtual remote learning, uh, class 29. Uh, and this week, we're going to be starting to talk about uh, civil rights. And we're going to talk about this over the course of the next two weeks in different ways. Uh, today, we're going. To, this week is going to be around African-American civil rights. Um, so we're going to start a little bit talking about generally what civil rights are today, what, what they are and then turn to the uh, first half of, our, of a kind of historical unit on African-American civil rights, uh, looking at slavery, abolitionism, and reconstruction. So that's our agenda for today. So let's go ahead and get started. So what are civil rights? And civil rights as, uh, uh, are, di are different than civil liberties, but these are guarantees, as your textbook describes, by the government that it will treat people equally, particularly people belonging to groups that have historically been denied the same rights and opportunities as others. So as civil liberties are these kind of client universal protections that all individuals have against government intrusion on their lives um, or, or certain right liberties to participate in politics or exercise their freedom of their their freedom of speech and writing and and, and their vote civil rights do deal more with is the law going to treat all people equally do all people gain the same protections of the law or is does the law um create legitimate discriminations between people. And one way we can see this is in the first section of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail that was passed, ratified after the Civil War, that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the jurisdiction of our citizens of the United States, and therefore no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protections of its laws, right? So if you are a citizen of the United States, you are protected uh, in a series of ways, right? That you shall, you can't, your privileges and immunities of citizenship cannot be abridged. You cannot be deprived of your life, liberty, or property without due process, right? That you have to, you can't, the state can't just uh, imprison you without tr trying you nor can uh, the laws not be applied equally to you. So these ideas of kind of like citizenship rights, uh, uh, due process and equal protection are this kind of, are the hallmark of, of civil rights. Uh, but laws are discriminatory all the time, right? We have laws about age, we have age requirements to vote, smoke or drink, right? We might have law, we have laws that prevent um, you from driving until you have a certain uh, to, uh, until you are a certain age but also laws to prevent you from driving if you are blind and so we we make discriminatory laws all the time now the, the question always when we're talking about civil rights is are these law discriminatory laws legitimate or when is the government allowed to discriminate between different groups of people and when is it not and there's a series of kind of court tests that have kind of evolved but the the main idea here is what's known as the rational basis test and this is, as your textbook describes it, as long as there's a reason for treating some people differently that is, quote, rationally related to a legitimate government interest, the discriminatory act or law or policy is acceptable. So you can discriminate. You can, for example, may put age requirements to vote that discriminate against younger people. You can, uh, the so you can Social Security Act, right? You cannot draw Social Security until you reach the retirement age, right? There are the all sorts of discriminatory provisions and laws, but that has to be limit related to a legitimate government interest. There has to be a legitimate reason. Now, of course, legitimate government interest is um, not clearly defined in the case law. And so the courts often have to decide, is this law legitimate government interest. So just like the courts are the kind of where civil liberties actually get adjudicated, it's also really important for civil rights. And the courts, in addition to this rational basis test, there's also the idea of a protected class. And these are specific groups of people with specific legal protections against discrimination. Um, the United States federal law currently recognizes nine protected class, sex, race, age, ability, color, creed, national origin, religion, or genetic information. Different states have different, stand, uh, different standings too, right? Some states include uh, gender identity uh, and um, sexual orientation in their protected classes. But the idea behind these is that there are, these are special uh, protections that are legally in front of instantiated that prohibit discrimination on these classes, that you have to have a much higher burden here if, you're going, if there's going to be any sort of discrimination on these bases, that these are protected classes. Um, so this means that you can discriminate like 
on the basis of comic book lovers, perhaps, because comic book lovers are not a protected class because they ha don't have face a history of discrimination uh, against each other. Uh, but you can't have a law that discriminates on the basis of sex or race or age. Um, or if it does, it's going to, like voting age requirements, right, it's going to require a much higher burden of proof. So the courts, when they're reviewing this, as I said, the courts are kind of the arbiters of, is there a legitimate government interest, apply different standards of scrutiny. That is like the government has to clear a different kind of burden, a threshold of proof in order to prove its legit actions are legitimate. So intermediate scrutiny is that the government has the burden of proof to prove that, it, that the discriminatory law is substantially related to an important governmental objective. And gender and sex-based discrimination are, uh, are examined with intermediate scrutiny. And so the government has to prove that there's a substantial relation to an important government objective, that there has to be a good reason for the law. And this is a kind of middle ground, right? That the, the burden of proof is on the government to prove this, not on the plaintiff suing, um, the, the claimant suing for, on the basis of discrimination. The highest standard of scrutiny is known as strict scrutiny, which requires both all, all three kind of requirements, a compelling state interest. So it can't just be something that the government wants about, but it has to be kind of like a very core state interest. It has to be narrowly tailored law. It can't just be an expansive law that um, with broad discriminations. And it has to be the least restrictive means possible, which means if there was a way to achieve the same compelling state interest without discrimination, the government, then this is not a legitimate form of a law. <laughs> Race, ethnicity, religion, and national origin are all treated by the courts with strict scrutiny. So if there's a law that has discriminations on the basis of race, the government has a much higher burden to prove all three of these conditions in order to justify this law. So this is kind of the legal jurisprudent, jurisprudential questions here. But often when we think about civil rights, we think about the history of the civil rights movement, and in particular, the history of African-American enfranchisement, the long, slow, and uneven process by which uh, African-Americans um, were fully integrated and fully incorporated into the Republic. Um, and of course, this is an, not a finished process, but we're going to talk about this historical process over the next, over today and in the next class. So we've already talked about this with the 1619 Project reading at the very beginning of the semester, but it's important to remember that slavery is instantiated, it is literally encoded in the Constitution in several places. In Article 1, Section 2, the Three-Fifths Compromise, you'll recall that the, a whole, that the apportionment for represent, representatives and taxes is based on the whole number of free persons and, and three-fifths of all other persons. Now, it doesn't say slavery, but that is because it, we're excluding Indians not taxed. If you're not free, you are a slave, uh, and so three-fifths of those persons are counted. Additionally, Article 1, Section 8 includes that Congress to provide the calling forth of the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Again, this doesn't explicitly talk about slavery, uh, but one of the purposes of having a militia to suppress insurrections was exactly to suppress slave revolts. That the, one of the insurrections that the framers had in mind was the possibility of slave revolts. Finally, the migrant in Article 1, Section 9, the migration or importation of such persons as any, as any of the states now existing shall think it proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808 that a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation. Here the idea, the importation of such persons, this is referring to the slave trade. The slave trade could not be outlawed until 1808. Uh, so it was legally protecting with the Constitution the slave trade. So the practices of, uh, of American slavery are, are not simply a practical a practice that was a, in, in contrast with the Constitution, but the Constitution both recognized and legitimated these practices. And we can see this even more by looking at Federalist 54, written by James Madison, uh, which recognizes the deep hypocrisy built into the constitutional compromises here, and it focuses on the three-fifths compromise. So on the one hand, Madison acknowledges an argument made by northern states uh, a, uh, that, they, that the southern states should not count slaves towards state-based representations. Uh, he writes, slaves are considered as property, not as persons. They ought, therefore, to be comprehended in an estimate of taxation, which are founded on property, and to be excluded from a representation which is regulated by a census of persons. And here the argument made by the North is, if you are going to deny these people their human rights, if you are going to hold them as property, you don't get to count them towards your representation, that you can't have it both ways. However, Madison then invents for most of this 
um, a Southern brethren, and it's important to note that Madison himself was from Virginia, who offers a defense of the three-fifths compromise. Uh, and Madison doesn't make the argument in his own words, but at the end of the essay on pages 337 to 338, he writes that, on the whole, I must confess that it fully reconciles me to the scale of representation which the convention has established. Remember, these are published anonymously um, under the name Publius uh, to the people of New York, right? So in theory, like, right, this is, Madison is kind of inventing this persona to offer kind of his opinions, potentially. And he writes that, the Southern Brethren uh, writes that, the true state of the case is that they, slaves, partake in both these qualities, property and persons, being considered by our laws in some respects as persons and other respects as property. And here Madison is arguing that there's a, that, that the three-fifths justify, uh, uh, three-fifths compromise is justified by what he calls the mixed character of the slave. Uh, and while this sounds abhorrent, uh, the Southern gentleman points out the hypocrisy of uh, of northern states who both condemn slavery as immoral, but then don't want to count slaves as persons for the purpose of representation, writing, might not some surprise also be expressed that those who reproach the southern states with the barbarous policy of considering as property a part of their human brethren should themselves contend that the government to which all the states or parties ought to consider this unfortunate race more completely in the unnatural light of property than the very laws of which they complain. That the northern, that the southern states say, if we, can, you're the ones who want it both ways. You are the ones who are saying that we are immoral, but you want, do not want to count these as people when it comes to actual representation. So both sides, Madison unwittingly kind of exposes, are 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 bound up in this hypocrisy that this that this slavery, even from the perspective of anti-slavery state, free states in the north. The, the rights and dignities and personage of, of African slaves in the, in, in the states was not respected even by free states. And, and Madison concludes with this, let the case of the slave be considered as it is in truth a peculiar one. Let the compromise expedient of the constitution be mutually adopted, but which regards them as inhabitants, but as debased by servitude below the legal level the equal level of free inhabitants, which regards the slave as divested of two-fifths of the man. Now, later, um, W.E.B. Du Bois will take up this idea uh, when he talks about the double consciousness of, of, of the, of, uh, the African-American, who is both um, sees himself as a full person, but also sees himself through the eyes of, uh, of, of, of white supremacy. And here, Madison is kind of this, this idea of slavery as this peculiar case is already pointing to how in both American culture and American law that, 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 that there is this mixed role, that there is a double character of, 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 of the person who is held in bondage. Uh, who is both regarded as a person, but also divested of, but precluded from full personhood. And this, 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 this idea of the slave being divested of two fifths of man will kind of be the specter that haunts America throughout its, through until this day. So, abolitionism is the movement uh, in the United States to um, call for the end of slavery, to abolish slavery, and emancipate the states. And there were abolitionist writings that existed during the colonial period. So this was not, it was not the case of the Constitution, uh, that no one at the time of the, uh, the Constitution was written was aware of abolitionist arguments or aware of the moral arguments. In fact, the fact that Madison is kind of working through all these mental gymnastics in Federalist 54 rec is a kind of a recognition that these moral arguments were already being made. Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense, right, wrote an influential essay in 1775 that called for the, the uh, called African and Slavery in America that argued for the abolition of slavery and the freedom of all slaves. Um, so there were people in the United States uh, or in the, the, the American colonies, who kind of recognized the, 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 this hypocrisy and called for this full realization of Republican values. Uh, but abolitionism really takes off in the 1830s um, with people like William Lloyd Garrison and his magazine, The Liberator, uh, which is a weekly newspaper that published abolitionist essays until slavery was abolished. Um, and so through Lloyd Garrison in the North and others um, would pen these essays and try to rally people to the cause of abolition. But there was a significant debate over the, the speed of abolitionism. Uh, abol many abolitionists argued for immediate emancipation of slaves, that if we are going to abolish slavery now and immediately free the slaves. But many anti-slavery politicians in the North, including Abraham Lincoln, called such measures too extreme and sought a compromise. Um, try, there would be like a gradated abolition that would not be immediate emancipation. 
There is also significant debate within the abolitionist movement over the role of the Constitution. Garrison and his followers condemned the Constitution as a slavery pact. They would hold rallies where they would burn copies of the Constitution. Um, but others, like the anarchist Lysander Spooner, argued that natural law and social contract principles of the Constitution could be mobilized against slavery. And it is in this latter camp that Frederick Douglass uh, situates himself. Now, Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in Maryland, but eventually escaped northward and became a leader in both the abolition movement and the women's suffrage movement. He was particularly noted for his eloquence, his rhetoric, and his oratory, as you can see from the re reading of his speech, What to a Slave is the Fourth of July, an 1852 address on the commemoration of Independence Day. He also published the influential narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, in 1845, which became a bestseller. He was recruited by William Lloyd Garrison to speak and at his rallies and write for the Liberator um, to kind of tell the story of his enslavement and his escape. Um, and, and, and Frederick Douglass, uh, in, in What is Slave is the Fourth of July, tries to do, uh, to appeal to, as you notice, the first five or six pages is all about praising the American Revolution and praising the Founding Fathers for standing up for Republican principles, for standing up against tyranny and for liberty, before in the second two-thirds of the essay he, try, he shifts to the question of slavery and shows the blatant discrepancy between these principles and uh, the practice of slavery. So he writes in this essay, what to the American slave is your, and you'll notice that he often, when he talks about the 4th of July, he uses the he uses uh, the second person, not the first person pronouns. He always calls it your declaration of independence or your 4th of July. And this is because I answer a day that reveals to him a slave more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim to him. Your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your natural greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciations of tyrants, brass front and impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him more bombast, fraud, deception, and piety and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would which disgrace the nation of savages. This is the nation of the earth guilty this is not a nation. There is not a nation on earth guilty of the practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Similarly, uh, towards the end of the essay, fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of this country brands it, your republicanism a sham, your humanity as a base pretense and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to the mocking earth. It is antagonistic force in your government, the only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds insolence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it. And yet you cling to it as if it were the sweet anchor of all of your hopes. Oh, be warned. Be warned, a horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing away at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling you from this hideous monster and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. Now, in your discussion post for today, you're going to look more closely at, uh, at, at this speech, but it's important here that um, for Douglas, this is... American Republican principles, this idea that power comes from the people, that, that, that liberty should be preserved, um, is precisely what uh, should justify abolitionism. It is that America's like, founding ideals can be mobilized for, for Douglas uh, in the fight against slavery. And I'll leave it up to you all to discuss if you find that move, rhetorical move persuasive or not. Now, Abel, with the rise of abolitionism, it, this really became politicized throughout the westward expansion of the United States from a, in, the 19th, in the first half of the 19th century. And as you can see from this gift that is kind of expanding, it was really a question of would the, as the, the territories that uh, became incorporated as states, would they be slave states or would they be free states? And there was a consistent effort by both parties uh, to balance this out. The, the, the North wanted to maintain an equal wanted to prevent the South from getting a kind of voting block in the Congress. And so they, there was consistent debate and compromise over in order to ensure that there was a balance between free and slave states. Uh, this is, and I'm sure you remember from your American history classes, the um, bleeding Kansas, right? Uh, and the violence that broke up in the Kansas territory over the question of slavery. 
In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed that required that all escaped slaves upon capture be returned to their masters, and that officials and citizens of free states had to cooperate. And the idea here was that slaves that made it across into these into these free states in the north, um, that these free states were legally required by federal law to return and to arrest and return these slaves to their, their, to their masters. In 1857, the Supreme Court ruled in Dred Scott versus Sanford that blacks were not and could not become citizens. Uh, Dred Scott was born into slavery, but spent time in the free states and territories um, but before he was arrested um, and returned to his, ma uh, to his, to his master in the via the Fugitive Slave Act. And he sued, saying that his residence in the territories should have freed him. But the court held that because they could not become blacks could not become citizens, whether they were free or slave, that Scott had no standing to sue in court. And the, the court also held that the Congress had the authority to permit slavery in the territories. Ultimately, this culminated in the Civil War, which forced the hands of both parties, um, and violence broke out for four years. Um, and over the question of slavery. And, and Lincoln, the reluctant abolitionist, issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, that abolished slavery in the Confederate States, but it did not end slavery in the Union States, nor did it end slavery in, sta in Confederate States that Union soldiers currently occupy. It wouldn't be until the Civil War amendments after the war particularly the 13th Amendment ratified in 1865, that slavery and involuntary servitude shall um, um, shall exist, shall be abolished in the United States. Now you'll notice, except as a punishment for crime, and this is if you've, uh, uh, you might be familiar with Ava DuVernay's um, documentary 13th, which focuses on uh, um, mass incarceration in the carceral state, um, that, that, that slave labor still exists in this country for, for prisoners. Um, and it's important to note that. Additionally, the Second Civil War Amendment, uh, the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, contains a series of provisions. The first, as we saw, is the Citizenship, Due Process, and Equal Protection Clauses of Section 1. Section 2 basically abolishes the three-fifths compromise, and representatives would be apportioned by whole persons, except for states, uh, the southern slave states and the Confederacy states who engaged in acts of rebellion and, and denied um, and, and held slaves, that their representation would be decreased. Um, the third argument is, section prohibits Confederates, uh, conv uh, those who took up arms against the United States, from holding office. And fourth, um, the public duty of the United States cannot be questioned. Um, not really relevant to what we're talking about. And the 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870, which states that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, guaranteeing, um, at least in theory, the, um, the rights of all uh, black men to vote, regardless of uh, their, their, their race or previous conditions of servitude. Now this 14th Amendment, especially these two these two sections, which disempowered and disenfranchised Southern slaveholder politicians in, 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 in the South, made possible what's known as uh, Radical Reconstruction, which began in 1865. Um, form, and during, after the Civil War, many former Confederate states put in black codes that sought to restrict the civil rights and liberties of former slaves. Um, in 1866, this Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. Um, which, which, excuse me, gave equal rights and benefits of the laws regardless of color or race. And with the combination of uh, radical Republicans moving to the South, um, the military occupation by the Union Army, and the disenfranchisement of former Confederates, this allowed for those radical Repu Republicans to enforce civil rights laws and basically rebuilds uh, the society in the South. And during this time, there was a significant number of uh, uh, of, Afri uh, of African Americans or former slaves and. And, uh, and free, uh, that we, that ran for and held office in the South, um, that the disempowerment and disenfranchisement and, and shift in the representation of the Southern states allowed for the civil rights amendments to get passed at all, uh, or allowed for the 15th Amendment at least um, to get passed at all and allowed for the military occupation to to kind of enforce the Civil Rights Act. However, they were contested by uh, the Ku Klux Klan, a terrorist organization committed to white supremacy that formed after the Civil War to forcibly end Reconstruction through violence, um, that their goal was to prevent black men from exercising suffrage rights through violence and intimidation. Now, Reconstruction, unfortunately, was not to be completed um, because uh, um, in, 
because of the Hayes-Tilden Compromise or the Compromise of 1877. Now, the 1876 election was one of the most disputed ever. Um, Til uh, Tilden, the Democrat, won the uh, popular vote, but uh, in the first count of electoral votes, Tilden won 184 electoral votes. Hayes won 165 with 20 votes on uh, uh, with 20 votes uncounted resolve. Uh, from four states unresolved. In Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, each party reported its candidate had won the state, while in one, or, uh, one, in or, one elector from Oregon uh, was replaced after being illegal for being an elected or appointed official. And there was all sorts of controversy, but eventually in 1877, an informal deal was struck that was not written down, um, but it was struck in the House of Representatives. And the all 20 of the disputed electoral votes would go to Hayes. Um, and so the, these yellow states here would become red uh, would become red states. So the Republicans would gain the presidency. Uh, but in exchange, the Republicans promised to basically end reconstruction. They withdrew federal troops from the South, ending uh, re Republican reconstruction and ceded power in the southern states to Democratic redeemers who proceeded to disenfranchise black voters thereafter that in order to maintain national power, the radical Republicans basically gave up on the, on the quest for reconstruction and to fully kind of incorporate um, African Americans into the Republic in the South and to, and to full, and enforce uh, through the power of the US Army, um, the Civil Rights Act. So this was this uh, um, political cartoon you can see over here. It talks about um, that this this was a compromise with the South in which liberty is weeping, um, that um, the, the tombstone in memory of Union heroes and a pointless war or sorry, useless war that many viewed this as the ultimate betrayal of um, why the war was fought and the principles of the radical Republicans. After Reconstruction in 1883, uh, the Supreme Court overturned the Civil Rights Act of 1875 in a series of cases known as the Civil Rights Cases and allowed for segregated businesses. Um, it held that private individuals and businesses were not bound by the 14th Amendment, that the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause is only applied to state and congressional actions. And this allowed for the cre uh, and this allowed for the creation of a racial caste system, uh, which private businesses could prevent, uh, could could discriminate on the basis of race. In 1896, the Supreme Court decided in Plessy versus Ferguson that state and local governments had the right had, had the authority and right to pass and enforce segregation laws as long as they upheld the separate but equal doctrine. The segregation does not violate equal protection as long as segregated facilities are equal. Um, so this included schools, uh, hospitals, drinking fountains, restrooms, that as long as the facilities were quote unquote equal, that, there, that, they, that segregation did not viol violate equal protection. And we'll pick up our story next class by looking at the, the efforts of the civil rights movement uh, to challenge uh, the Jim Crow laws in the South, uh, the, 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 the form of racialized apartheid that, maintained, that persisted in, in the 20th century United States. Um, so in addition to kind of filling out the story that you read in the American government textbook, uh, I, there's a couple of sort uh, there's a, the, the, uh, I'm asking you to read Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail and a more recent piece by Juliet Hooker on this, on, on an idea of democratic repair. So I'd like you to think about what, what, what do you think democratic repair means and how did the civil rights movement and Black Lives Matter contribute to this idea? Now for the discussion thread, I'm asking you to look closely back at Douglas's speech, What to a Slave is the Fourth of July? And I want you to analyze its political and rhetorical argument. How does Douglas go about making the case for abolition? Do you think his rhetoric is effective? What would be a different approach than the rhetorical approach that he is using? So remember, everyone, I'm asking everyone to reply to one of the threads this week by Friday at midnight, so either today's or Wednesday's. And then by Sunday at midnight, you need to reply with a 100 word post to one of your peers posts about any of the uh, any of the topics that have been raised. So that's it for today on the first half of African American civil rights. If you have any questions, feel free to email me stop by office hours on Wednesday. Uh, as a reminder, my my Friday office or, or uh, so, uh, stop by any of my office hours, um, stop by in the discussion section on Friday, send me an email, we'll work something out. As always, stay safe, stay healthy, take care of each other, and I'll see you next time.